good evening, everyone. I'm very happy today to host the presentation by Professor Dimitri Skiadas, who is a guest at the Center for the Study of Europe, and he's been great through the pandemic. He's brought a lot of life to our group. He's a professor of European and International Studies and Jean Monnet Chair at the University of Macedonia in Greece. He is currently with us in Boston as a visiting researcher, and uh, he's an innovative scholar who focuses on questions of importance to contemporary European politics and democracy, and has authored 11 books and many articles and chapters in books focused on questions of democracy. He works on EU governance, uh, fiscal matters, uh, the problems of migration, and in fact, has a forthcoming book entitled EU Migration Governance, Budgeting and Spending in Times of Crisis, as seen by the European Court of Auditors. Eulalia Rubio uh, is Senior Research Fellow at the Jacques Delors Institute. She will help us discuss the presentation by Professor Schiadas. Her research and publications focus particularly on the EU budget, on EU cohesion policies, and the reform of economic and monetary union. Eulalia holds a PhD degree in political science from the European University Institute in Florence and a master's degree in social and public policies from the Pompeo Fabra University in Barcelona. Uh, before joining the Institute, she worked as associate professor in comparative politics at the Pompeo Fabra University. And from 2014 to 2017, she was also an associate professor in European economic governance at the European School of Political and Social Sciences of the Catholic University of Lille. We also have as a discussant our dear friend and founder of this very center, Professor Vivian Schmidt, uh, Jean Monnet Professor of European Integration, Professor of International Relations in the Frederick S. Pardee School of Global Studies, and Professor of Political Science at Boston University. Her research focuses on European political economy, institutions, democracy, and political theory in particular on the importance of idea and discourse in political analysis, uh, known as discursive institutionalism. Her latest book is Europe's Crisis of Legitimacy, Governing by Rules and Ruling by Numbers in the Eurozone, published in 2020. Her current work, supported by a Guggenheim Fellowship, focuses on the rhetoric of discontent uh, and produces a transatlantic investigation of the populist revolt. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce the main speaker, Professor Skiades. So I would like to thank you all for being here today to my lecture regarding the presentation of my research so far in the Center for the Study of Europe in Boston University. I'd like to thank the Center for giving me this opportunity and as well as the two discussions, Professor Vivian Schmidt and uh, Eulalia Rubio from Jacques Delors Institute for being here and providing uh, useful comments for my presentation. Uh, let me share my screen with you. So we will be in a position to discuss it and well, Legitimacy crisis and autocratic legalism, the case of the EU budget, I have decided to talk about uh, the EU budget. Why? Because, well, from the early start of my research, whenever I was addressing this issue, I was getting the same reply. We are doing a good analysis, but it's a dull subject, meaning that it's a very technical subject, something that has not captured the hearts and souls of the academic community. It's an important tool, however. Why? Because uh, in all major instances of uh, the European integration historic course, the budget was always a debated issue. And in that respect, we can always remember Aaron Wildavsky approach regarding the budget. Aaron Wildavsky said that you may say whatever you want about the Europeans. The Europeans, they do not agree on what kind of society they want. They do not agree on what sort of government they want, but they can do at least one thing. They can talk and decide about their budget. So taking that into account, I think that we should uh, see the budget as a very interesting and as well as important tool when we study EU. Now, there are many definitions. I have decided to use one which is inclusive and provided by the OECD. The budget is a central policy document uh, showing how it prioritizes and it achieves annual and multi-annual objectives. And apart from financing programs, the budget is also an instrument of fiscal policy and influences the economy as a whole. Alongside with other governmental instruments such as regulations, legislation, and joint action, the budget turns plans and aspirations into reality. And this is a point that I would like to focus, turning plans into reality, because the budgetary governance is a date with reality. This is how I understand it, at least. Why? Because 
the budget being a contract between citizens and state shows how resources are raised and how expenditure is allocated for the delivery of public services and uh, uh, procurement of public goods. It is a basis of accountability. And when drafting and implementing a budget, everything, political ideas, declarations, points of view programs are being put to the test when it comes to financing. And at the same time, we have a very peculiar entity, the EU. The EU is a generous institutional entity resembling to a state and international organization as well, but being neither. It's not a state, it's not an international organization. And this peculiarity is reflected in EU budgetary governance. And we will see that as we will examine the course of uh, European integration progress with regard to its budget element. I will not uh, go into the details of the historical development because these are more of a historical value. However, I would like to point out that while initially uh, the main actor was the council. Progressively, the parliament was involved in the budgetary process, uh, acquiring authorities, acquiring uh, rights of intervention. For instance, uh, the final say on the so-called non-compulsory expenditure, the right to reject the budget, but not to amend it. Uh, all these issues were a matter of uh, political debate, especially during the 70s and the 80s. And uh, at that point, the main issue was uh, how much money the budget is going to have, what is going to be the allocation of uh, expenditure, and the veto power of the various participants, including the member states and all those uh, dis uh, discussing the budget, which led to the so-called agreement at the smallest possible call practice. They tried to agree only uh, by reflecting the most minimalist preferences and uh, the most the lowest common denominator was uh, the denominator selected for the outcomes this was an institutional equilibrium which led all, which led also to complicated arrangement which was maintained for many years until the lisbon treaty the lisbon treaty changed things and changed things significantly and i remember that at that time in uh, 15 years ago, there was an initiative about reforming the budget in which one of our discussant, discussants, uh, Lalia Rubio, was very actively involved. So the distinction between the compulsory and non-compulsory expenditure has been abolished. The annual process has been streamlined, has been simplified. Uh, and we have now what we call a budgetary co-decision template. In order to see that template, you see the schemes here. I'm, I'm not going to describe them in detail because that's not the purpose of my lecture today. I will just say that we have the start of kick from the commission on the 1st of September with the draft budget. It's sent to both the parliament and the council. The council has the responsibility to provide its common position at first. Then the budget has to work on that. Uh, if it adopts the council's position, then we have budget. If it uh, adopts amendments, then we go to the conciliation committee. And uh, the conciliation committee will have to produce a draft text. And uh, this text will reflect both the council's and the parliament's views. If this text is adopted by both institutions, then we have a budget. If the council rejected and uh, the parliament approves it, then we have a budget again. If the council approves it and the parliament rejects it, we don't have a budget. And if both institutions reject the conciliation committee's text, then we don't have a budget. We And the whole process starts again. You see that actually the final word, the final say now lies more or less with some procedural requirements with the parliament. That is a drastic change from what used to be the case 30 years ago. Now, the Lisbon Treaty also has incorporated other changes. For instance, the so-called multi-annual financial frameworks. That was a practice adopted back in 1988 by within the initiative of the then president of the commission, Jacques Delors. Now we have uh, this multi-annual programming known also as financial perspectives, 
which uh, takes place every seven years, it used to be five, now it's seven, and it sets political priorities and ceilings of revenue and expenditure. These uh, ceilings uh, create a stable environment for financial programming. The allocations on an annual basis are made through the budget, but the total spending remains below the ceilings set uh, at the MFF framework. Now, the procedural aspect, which is one of the issues that we're going to talk about in the lecture, has to do with the unanimous decision of the Council after obtaining the consent, and I'm fo focusing on the term consent of the Parliament. And the Parliament has to adopt that by a majority of its members. Another interesting issue, the own resources system, how the revenue of the budget uh, is produced, established in the 70s. We have four types so far, and for a fifth one has been established quite recently. The customs duties, the VAT contributions, the direct contributions based on gross national income by the member states, and other revenues such as fines or EU taxation, meaning the taxes paid by EU officials. The new source is a contribution based on the non-recycled plastic packaging weights, which is in force since January 1st, 2021. And we have two other resources forthcoming, a financial transaction tax, which refers to the banks, and a financial contribution based on the, a new common corporate tax base, which has to do with taxation of companies. Again, the procedural aspects which are of primary concern to our lecture today is the fact that, again, the council decides unanimously after consulting another term, consulting with the parliament, and the decision then has to be approved by the member states according to their respective constitutional arrangements. Furthermore, if we have implementing regulations about the system, then the uh, council is responsible for their enactment after updating the consent of the parliament. So you see that we have various terms, consent, we have uh, con consultation, and we had the co-decision. We will see how all these come together when we will discuss the so-called democratic deficit of the Union and how this deficit is found in the EU budgetary governance. Well, the EU has tried, has tried to establish a nature of democracy within it. It has tried to acquire a certificate of democratic nature. And this certificate is based on specific provisions in the EU treaties. For instance, Article 2 about the principles of democracy, uh, Article 10 about representative democracy, direct representation of citizens, Article 10 again about openness, transparency, accountability, Article 11 about direct involvement of citizens. However, despite all these fundamental provisions, several com commentators and a significant part of public opinion, I may add, has talked about the democratic deficit of the EU. This term is used to describe a situation in which the EU institutions and their decision-making procedures suffer from lack of democracy and they seem to be inaccessible to the average, to the ordinary citizen due to their complexity. In my view, I would consider the demographic deficit being, uh, let's say, represented by the absence of any actual European politics. The average EU voter doesn't feel that he has the possibility to reject the so-called European government if they don't like it or change the politics or policies of the Union. And uh, if we take these considerations into the EU budgetary governance context, we will have some interesting findings. As we said before, the own resources decision or the MFF approval, both require a unanimous decision by the council after obtaining either the consent or the consultation with the parliament. Now, the concept of consent has been, until very recently, an issue of controversy between the Parliament and the Council. If you ask the parliamentarians or the Parliament's legal service, they will say, okay, that's another wording for co-decision. In the Council's view, and in, on this point, the Council supported, is supported by the Commission, consent is a far less demanding process than co-decision. It's not co-decision, because if the uh, 
members that would like to have a co-decision process that would have provided for a decision process, not just a consent. Uh, the consent covers a broad political agreement on general issues, not details. That is the approach adopted so far. And you can see that, that the council actually decides. Parliament is merely informed, providing consent, or simply is consulted. That means that the, it is actually the council that determines the revenue of the EU. It is the council that sets the framework within which the parliament may act on an annual basis during the annual budgetary process. So this is a peculiar equilibrium. While the, par while the parliament has a primary role over the annual budgetary process, the council has set the political agenda, the policy agenda, and the ceiling of resources and expenditure that the parliament may use during the annual budgetary process. So I would like just to put a question. Who in democracy and law is the ultimate institutional empire? Referee, if I may use this term, of the EU budgetary process. Now, if we take history in order to find the reply to this question, I think that we will not have much of, much of a success. The parliament has been reluctant to use its authority over the budgetary process. During the various debates over the years, only twice the parliament has vetoed the budget before the Lisbon Treaty in 1979 and 1984. And after the Lisbon Treaty, the conciliation committees working have failed to produce a commonly accepted text on four occasions, the last one being the budget of 2020. However, in all these occasions, the new draft budget put forward by the commission were adopted on time. It seems that the parliament seems to content itself by having the, afford, the authority to grant discharge or not granting discharge to the commission and other bodies uh, by exercising political control. It seems that they focus on that instead of just the budgetary process as we know. It, this procedure has been employed practically once in the sense that only in 1999, the parliament denied to provide the commission with a discharge. And you all remember the cataclysmic developments at that time in the EU. Now, with regard to the council, the negotiations between the member states seem to be blown out of proportion. What do I mean by that? The budget, in nominal terms, seems quite impressive. On average, about 100, more than 150 billion per year. An impressive figure. However, in relevance to the gross national income of the EU, that figure is only about 1% of the uh, gross national income of the European Union. And if you want to compare this percentage with a percentage at national level, the average national budget of an EU member state it's about 48% of its GDP. So you see that when talking about the EU budget, and if someone would like to transfer the negotiations about the EU budget into the national context of political debate about public finance, I think that in terms of uh, numbers, at least, that could be just another, every, uh, another everyday business uh, discussion. It's a small size. However, we see that when discussing the EU budget, either on an MF level or on an annual basis, most political leaders, national political leaders, wish to project an image of fighting for the national interest. They want to seen as trying to reduce the budgetary contributions of their country and increase their budgetary receipts. And they like to use an atmosphere of political drama, suspense, in order to, to say that at the last moment, we agreed on a settlement. I believe that you all can share experiences with uh, such uh, developments. Now, for instance, during the last three occasions of negotiating MFFs, uh, 2007, 2013, 2014, 2020, 2021, 2027, you can see from this scheme that uh, there were large gaps of discussion after the initial start of a debate. 
Why? Because the participating actors focus on the priorities of the national electorates, not on the priorities of the European issues put forward. Uh, and uh, this resulted in e extended negotiating periods reaching up to three years before having a political agreement, with, which would be the basis for the legal instruments uh, with regard to the MFF. And unfortunately, that focus on the national agenda, although in the EU context, has been uh, noted in European elections as well. Now, in all these proceedings, we have the parliament providing an ex post consent. It's true that the parliament on all three occasions, 2007, 2013, 2014, 2020, and 2021, 2027, rejected the, initially the agreements reached within the council and uh, called for negotiations. Uh, but the parliament's uh, involvement was not so visible especially compared with the visibility of the European Council's or the Council's deliberations over the same issues. So some commentators have said that, okay, the Parliament is just being involved as a formality with limited added value. And that is a significant element of democratic deficit in the EU budgetary process. And I think that this can lead us to the second argument, the legitimacy crisis. Well, legitimacy is a concept which is a bit hard to define. Vivian Schmidt can tell us a lot about it and I uh, wouldn't dare enter her domain there. I will just say that uh, usually legitimacy is assimilated to the market's invisible hand. It exists, we know it's there. We cannot explain easily how to create it or how it seems to disappear. It is closely related to authority and a legitimate authority is one which is recognized as valid or justified by those to whom it applies. That's the democratic concept of legitimacy. Now, in the academic discourse, we have identified three types of democratic legitimacy. Input legitimacy, output legitimacy, and throughput legitimacy. These are re reflected uh, in terms of relevance to the people. Input legitimacy by the people. Output legitimacy, for the people and throughput legitimacy with the people. In order to present it, I have used Vivian Smith's quite uh, illustrative uh, scheme in her latest book that Daniela Caruso referred to before. And uh, you can see here that we have input legitimacy. Legitimacy refers on politics, expression of preferences by the people through the national governments. Then we go to throughput legitimacy procedures how policy is formulated and implemented by the various actors and the interaction of these actors. This is the so-called black box of government. And then we have uh, the output legitimacy, policy delivery, the ideas, the results, the outcome, what we people enjoy as results of our government. Now, in order to apply this type of these types of legitimacy uh, to the EU budgetary governance, one might say that the input legitimacy focuses on EU budget politics, the preferences put forward at national and European level in order to see the Union, for instance, the European Union being involved in public policy field by funding initiatives in these fields or reallocate, reallocating resources. The output legitimacy focuses on EU budget results, the quality of the outcomes of the policies, the efficiency, the effectiveness, for instance, the FADIC and the proper management of migration flows, the provision to support innovative research, the realization of greener Europe, and so on. All of these are outcomes of policies funded by the budget. And then we go to the throughput legitimacy. Well, in this case, as it has been the case of the Eurozone area, as Vivian has, Vivian has explained in her previous book, in his late, excuse me, in his latest book, uh, the same problem that has been identified there has been identified also with regard to the budget. The EU itself has a very strange stance over EU budgetary governance. It has uh, created a legal, political, and economic complexity 
with regard to this governance, that it has conversed it into a realm of experts. Political governance has given away to technocratic governments. Decision-making authority is transferred by political actors to technical experts. And thus, we have the black box of EU budgetary governance. The average EU citizen cannot understand the processes through which the EU resources, which at the end of the day are provided by the citizens, are managed and used. As Vivian has said it quite clearly, the EU has favored technocratic throughput over popular input in order to produce optimal output. I think that phrase fits exactly the EU budgetary governance scheme. However, using throughput legitimacy can be very beneficial and critical for examining the budget and EU budgetary governance. Uh, the idea is to examine the space between the political input and the policy output. Thus, we will have light on the black box of the procedural budgetary government. It will provide us with a normative legitimacy adding to the performance-oriented legitimacy of output and the participation-oriented legitimacy of input. So we will examine the interactions between the various actors within EU budgetary governance. And the added value will allow us to assess the quality of this interaction. The throughput legitimacy is determined by the substance and the democratic characterization characteristics, excuse me, of that interaction. I will use certain examples. The ones that I mentioned before, the own resources, the own resources system. We said before that we have a system that works mainly through the council. The council is the main actor. In uh, the negotiations of the 20, 20, uh, 27, 2013 and 2014, 2020, MMFs, the national points of view prevailed. No significant change was made to the own resources system, despite suggestions by other actors, the civic society, academic society, commission, the parliament, so that shows a very low quality of interaction. A decision was made by the council, that was it, practically. With regard to the 2021-2027 negotiations, we see here a different thing. We see provision of new resources, a contribution based on the non-recycled plastic packaging waste, something that promotes the so-called Green and Europe initiative that shows a successful interaction of actors involved in this process. So we see here that examining with legitimacy allows us to conclude on quality. Now, with regard to the MFF adoption here, we see that uh, the parliament has employed, uh, history shows us that the parliament has employed various methods to increase its leverage. It has to provide only its consent. However, in the previous programming period to 2014-2020, the parliament's consent was given if only after the parliament had secured that some things regarding the annual budget of 2013 and 2014 were set and it increased the level of resources available. It provided for a flexibility arrangement, ability to carry over any used margin between headings and between years. And it provided a significant democratic uh, element, a post electoral revision to reflect new political ideas based on the results of European elections. So we see here that there was some fruitful interaction. In 2021-2027, we had a gridlock within the European Council for two years until July 2020. In July 2020, after a very extensive meeting of the European Council, we had an agreement. And don't forget at the time that we had also the additional pressure of finding a solution to the pandemic of the coronavirus uh, in, uh, situation. However, the parliament initially criticized the aspect, did not agree, did not provide consent. And after negotiations on specific issues, it provided uh, its consent in, 
November 2020 initially, and finally in December 2020, which introduced additional funding to policy areas uh, and uh, provided uh, with annual upward adjustments funded by competition fines. Now, with the annual budgetary procedure, one, one thing I can say only. I remember that the parliament here has an extensive involvement, indeed. The parliament's authority, being the main actor, provides for open, transparent procedures reflecting the citizens' aspirations. Don't forget that the parliament is directly elected. However, again, I will mention what I mentioned before. The policies and the ceilings have been predetermined in the MFF. So, given the smaller degree of throughput legitimacy of the MFF, I see that we see a mitigation of the significance of the Parliament's involvement in the annual budgetary process in terms of throughput legitimacy. And having said all that, I move to another stage of analysis, more of a legal nature, but equally important. The autocratic legalism and its interaction with EU budgetary governance. What is legalism, autocratic legalism? It's a behavior that exists in the name of law. However, it does not reflect the spirit and the purpose of law. You see that this has been identified as a, as a very important element of the so-called democratic decay situation that has been noted in recent academic analysis uh, regarding the global democratic recession that we have experienced. The idea of autocratic legalism is the use of electoral mandate. So we have democratically elected governments using law in the service of an illiberal agenda. So this use of law entails using the law to force the parliament to grant more authority to the executive by limiting its own authority, abusing the law by deliberately changing the interpretation of legislation in order to treat the executive and non-using the law by failing to enforce legal provisions considered to be against the executive's interest. So we see use, abuse and non-use of law in autocratic legalism. Autocratic legalism is not confined at national level. International law and EU law allowing state to do things that they could not accomplish without these provisions, the provision of public good that is, uh, have been hampered by autocratic legalism. Despite the fact that any legal provisions in principle at least is designed to protect and extend the sphere of, democ of democratic governance promote human rights, especially those regarding uh, civil rights, uh, democratic participation, freedom of expression, political participation, and so on. However, there have been behaviors, and I believe most of us are familiar with such behaviors, that uh, they do not reflect these specific characters, especially when we have economic or political mo motives involved. Now, Using rules and procedures by, on, on behalf of an authoritarian regime in order to enhance its position is a common occurrence. The EU has provided the context for such a use. I will refer to two recent examples. One, during the 2021 uh, negotiation, we all know that one of the proposals of the European Commission was to establish a regulation providing uh, for the imposition of sanctions against member states that fail to meet the standards of adhering rule of law. Given the history of specific countries, namely Hungary and Poland, which have been brought before the Court of Justice for violating the rule of law, these countries decided that this approach uh, was an attack against them. So they said that they will veto the MFF regulation. The EU institutions separated this re regulation, the so-called political conditionality regulations from the MFF legislative package and introduced it under the ordinary legislative procedure. It was, a, a, it was accepted, although amended and amended significantly. And the two countries approved the MFF agreement. However, two months afterwards, 
under the threat of eventual budgetary sanctions, they vetoed something else, which is of equal importance for the whole procedure, the own resources decision, thus blocking the entire MFF process. So you see that these countries used their veto authority, which has been given to them for specific purposes, for something completely different. It is a textbook application of autocratic legalism compounded by the fact that in order to resolve this, this problem, the negotiations that led to the approval, the final approval in December 2020 of the overall package took place behind closed doors between the German presidency of the council and uh, these two countries. Another example of autocratic legalism has to do with judicial review. Now, in the EU context, the Court of Justice of the European Union is one of the most powerful judicial institutions worldwide. It enjoys a particular type of accountability. And in order for someone to put a case before it, we have three possible categories of applicants. The institutions and the member states, the so-called privileged applicants, they can challenge anything. We have the quasi-privileged applicants, court of auditors, central bank, committee of regions, and we have the non-privileged applicants, which are the rest of us, natural and legal persons. Now, I'm not going to, go, to enter the details of a specific policy area, which is the cohesion policy. However, you all know that in the cohesion policy, in the EU cohesion policy, the main actor are the regional authorities, the regions as subnational actors. The fact is that although under the arrangements, the current arrangements of EU cohesion policy, the regions have so many authority, the Court of Justice has denied them the right to challenge a decision depriving them of cohesion resources. The reasoning, because the regional authorities are non-privileged applicants, they can establish individual concern because the relevant decisions mention them, but they cannot establish direct concerns because the money is given to the state, the central government. And if the EU funds are being are revoked, then the national budget will come to the rescue and will cover the gap. Similar approaches have been identified in other policy areas, such as common agricultural policy. Legally speaking, this approach has been seen as correct. But if seen uh, under the specter of throughput legitimacy, I think that we can identify significant shortfalls. As we said, the, the regional authorities are quite uh, influential actors in the EU cohesion policy context. They provide uh, input, they manage funds, they are the beneficiaries. So they interact with all other actors, national authorities, EU authorities. They accumulate and use technical and scientific expertise and they provide good results. Progressively speaking, we see the good results. So why they are denied their right to protect their prerogatives when they're being deprived of resources. Well, the problem is that in this case, in this particular case, it was a judicial institution that provided this reasoning. Now, if we were in an authoritarian regime and we could simply say, okay, the judicial institution is being used to do that. In the case of the EU, however, we don't have an authoritarian regime. We have, however, an undoubtedly undemocratic point of view, limiting the regional authorities' right to protect their prerogatives. Amending the treaties would be a solution by granting regional authorities the same applicant status granted to their European counterpart, the Committee of the Regions. I will conclude with some remarks. Having seen all these issues of legitimacy, all these issues of autocratic legalism, all these issues of democratic uh, deficit in the EU budgetary process, I believe that it is time for the union as it discusses its future to see if the time has come to take the next step. What that step might be, I will not uh, bother you with the analysis because that's to come in my research. I will just give you the overview, having an entity with full democratic legitimacy that will manage the EU budget. Whether that would be a federal government, I'm using the dreaded F word or something else, it's a matter of debate. However, this would automatically act as a catalyst 
catalytic factor to resolving all these issues of legitimacy, throughput legitimacy, autocratic legalism, and democratic deficit. I believe that in that case, the union will have expressed not only the desire to go forward, but also to reflect its citizens' point of view. And with these remarks, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm open to your comments and your questions. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, Dimitri. Certainly a lot of drama in what was supposedly not a dramatic topic. Um, so I look forward to the comments now of uh, uh, Dr. Rubio first and uh, Professor Schmidt um, uh, following immediately thereafter. I wanted to uh, make sure that uh, the uh, participants uh, um, send their comments, questions uh, through the Q&A uh, box and uh, I will make sure to, um, to present them to the author or discussants uh, as appropriate. Thank you. Dr. Rubio, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation also. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I'm delighted to be here to talk about the EU budget, which is a very boring and sometimes not, uh, uh, not many people have interest on in that. So, so I totally agree with Dimitri that uh, that is, uh, it is very interesting as a political process. Uh, and sometimes, well, it, it is not very well understood. I will try to, to make some, some, there is a lot of information on your presentation, so I will not cover everything. And, and I must start maybe by saying, because I will feel more uh, relief if I say that I am a bit stressed because I am not an expert in legitimacy or democracy. And I am uh, talking uh, before uh, one of the great experts on this topic. So I will try not to say silly things on that. And I will try to say something on the EU budget and, um, and, and not enter into, I mean, as much as I can on, on, on more specific issues. But uh, I will try to follow a bit the, 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 the order of your presentation and say some open questions and maybe yeah, yeah, some, some, some contest some, some of your arguments or maybe make you think in, in different ways. Uh, first, the, the budget is a political issue. As I say, I mean, I, I totally agree that uh, uh, sometimes there are a lot of economies working on the EU budget and they totally uh, uh, they, 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 uh, they don't understand sometimes that, uh, that in the end, political uh, EU budgetary uh, outcomes are very much related with politics and not so much about the economy. Uh, so it's a very interesting topic. And one of the, ma the major crises in the story for European integration have been budgetary crises, so we know. Uh, maybe one thing that I, I was missing is that you, you start by saying very much uh, that the EU is, is a sui generis entity and we have to take this into account. But I would also say that the EU budget is a sui generis budget. And maybe you should also stress this because you start with the definition of uh, budget. But if you look at the definition you, 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 you provide of budget, the EU budget do not really fit into this definition. First, because it is a budget that is... Uh, it does not really have a fiscal dimension uh, because the, we know how it works, the own resource uh, uh, decision. It, it's a budget that is expenditure driven. So we, we first fix expenditures, we decide the expenditures, and then the revenues uh, come after to fill the expenditures. And most of the revenues we know because it is a case and it, it has not changed for a long time. And maybe I'm a bit pessimistic on that, but it's the case. Most of the revenues come from national contributions. It is more similar to international organizations type of uh, financing than to uh, member state which design a fiscal policy that tries to influence the economy and the society. I, I just want to say that we cannot do a lot of politics with the fiscal part of the EU budget. It's, we can try to int introduce new revenues, but even the new revenues we try to introduce, yeah, you say some of them are political in some sense, but um, many of them, for instance, the plastic contribution is in the end also national contribution. It's just that we, we calculate the contribution of each member state according to the amount of non-recycled plastic. But it's not really like an EU tax that uh, the EU authorities can use, to, you know, play with the, with the, with the rates and the base to, to make politics, fiscal politics. Then there are other two characteristics of the EU budget that I think it's important to highlight. The first is that at the EU level, budgetary politics, I, I think you say it a bit in some slides, but I think it's important to put it in, uh, into, to take it into account. At the EU level, budgetary politics is as much as about policies than uh, about institutions. And there is a lot of institutional conflict in EU, in EU budgetary politics, uh, meaning that 
sometimes, I mean, the three institutions that participate in EU budgetary governance, uh, they, they try to put forward policy goals, but they also try to put forward institutional goals. And we have seen it a, a lot with the European Parliament over, over time. So, it, so, so sometimes some of the demands of the Parliament have been more about gaining more power in EU budgetary politics than in passing some, you know, uh, financing some, some policy areas or putting more money here or there. And that's important to take into account. This institutional, that's different from the national level. We, we are in a polity in building, no, the, the EU level. So there is always this institutional dimension. And the other is that the EU budget, um, it, it's also differently political than national budgets in the sense that apart from the classic functions of allocation and redistribution and not stabilization because it does not have the volume to, to have this uh, function, it also plays a very political role as a tool that has been used to accompany steps towards further integration, no? like, uh, you know, to, to redistribute, to, to give safe payments, safe payments to member states to accept uh, further steps to our uh, integration. And that's something very sui generis also. And maybe we have to integrate this when, when we think in terms of uh, when we analyze the EU budget. Then on the budgetary governance, um, uh, I think that, I mean, you, you define it, you describe very well the difference between annual budget and MFF and uh, on resources. For me, the, I mean, the, it's true that the most important thing that has happened lately, you know, this, this latest, you know, later decades has been the Lisbon Treaty. And maybe it's also, I think I would have liked to see more clearly uh, highlighted how it changed everything, the Lisbon Treaty, in terms of, you know, the balance of power within the institutions. And at the moment when the Lisbon Treaty was ratified, there was this debate whether the European Parliament gain or lose from that. Um, but I think that now the consensus is that it really has lost actually the European Parliament. And when we talk, uh, I remember having talked with uh, former MEPs on that and uh, former MEPs that were involved in the budgetary negotiations before, before the, the establishment of the MFF into the treaty. And the main uh, argument they say is that uh, when the MFF was not legally binding, they negotiated the annual budget. Of course, they had a bit less power in the annual budget, but they negotiated the annual budget and they knew that if they were not happy with the annual budget, they can just they could just uh, contest the you know the financial perspectives and they were not obliged to accept the financial perspectives because it was an inter, uh, inter um, governmental agreement so that gave them a lot of leverage in the, in the annual budget negotiation and now they cannot do it i mean they, they are in this kind of constraint that is mff so it, it, and it's true that if we look at the past since the adoption of the lisbon treaty we can say that the, the parliament has had less less power in the negotiations that it has been less successful in the negotiations even if if in the last ones i think they, they could they they had managed uh, a bit too i mean quite well actually uh that's also one point that i disagree a bit with you i think you are uh, a bit strong uh, with the parliament that that you you're quite critical about the parliament that they haven't fought uh, enough or they haven't Use the power in all or negotiated uh, in all. I, I think I, I tend to be more uh, empathetic with them. I think I think it's really difficult for the parliament how it is now organized with the rules that we have to obtain a lot of things from from the negotiations. And I think they are quite clever in trying to obtain, you know, uh, secondary aspects that are nevertheless important also in the long term, like you know changes in the institution in in the, in the rules of the of the budget. Not, not, not the size of the budget. They, maybe they don't contest the size of the budget, but they, they are quite clever um, in, in, in some gains they have had on flexibility and this kind of things. It may be, it may sound uh, not very important, but I think in the end, uh, they, it, it gives them a bit more power in the long term. And another aspect also related, and I will end with this question of the European Parliament that you don't mention is, uh, and it's an open question, to which extent the European Parliament is an unitary actor because we treat it as a unitary actor, but actually uh, there are different, different preferences and interests between uh, the maps also uh, on the EU budget. And, and sometimes this is also a, a weakness of the European Parliament. I mean, we are very well aware of the difference between member states in the Council, but there are also different visions of the budget in uh, the European Parliament. And in fact, the fact of passing to this logic of consent 
as you say, that now we understand consent, not as codecision. Consent is either you, you take it or, or you don't take it. You, know, you have to say yes or no to the agreement uh, of the council. Puts a pressure to the council to, to, to have a unitary position because you cannot just do different amendments. You have to decide in single majority whether you you agree or you don't agree to the proposition that the council puts on the table. So I think this is yeah this is something important also to understand the, the, the position of the panel. Then on, on passing to the question of democratic deficit and legitimacy, and, and now I will try not to say, as I say with, in front of Vivian, something that is uh, totally out of, of you know, silly. But um, yeah, maybe the, the first thing about democratic deficit, um, yeah, it, it, we, we know that uh, there is this, this perception of democratic deficit of the EU. Uh, maybe I, I also, I would, nuance with this or at least see that it is not uh, so, so evident. I mean, you say a lot of people have this perception, but it's also contest. Some people say, well, uh, maybe, I mean, it's not a deficit of a democracy because, you know, there's also the legitimacy coming from the council. They are also democratic. So there is a debate. I, I think so. I mean, it is not so, so clear. And, it's, and it is not in all member states that majority of citizens think that there is a, a democratic deficit. I think so, but maybe, I mean, as I say, I'm not an expert on that. But, uh, but as far as I see from your side, you, 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 you very well describe, I mean, you take your own definition of that, and I think it's, it's a nice definition that this uh, democratic deficit is the lack of politics, you know, the lack of options and the lack of capacity to choose between one, one policy on the other. Um, in here also, one, one, one comment is exactly, to, I mean, and it's a bit provocative, but to which extent the EU budget is a good um, instrument to look at that? Because as, as, I, as I say, budgetary politics is, is sometimes more about uh, uh, institutions or institutional interests, or sometimes more about the distribution among member states than about different political options, actually. Uh, there is, if you look at the parliament, for instance, uh, the main, the main Parties do not have major different visions on, on where we have to spend. It's, it's, it's more about, and, and the parliament sometimes, the, 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 the maps, they vote more along national lines than along uh, political lines. I mean, it plays a role, the political party, but the national uh, cleavage is very important in, in, in EU budgetary politics. And then the other question is that you take the assumption that all the problem of a democratic deficit uh, stems from the fact that the role of the European Parliament is not very important in the budgetary governance. I think it's true. I mean, it's one of the causes uh, of, of, of this, but uh, I think it's not the only one. I think there are other things that might explain also the perception that some citizens might have that the EU budget do not, uh, that they cannot change uh, of, of budgetary policy at EU level. Uh, and I can list some of them. For instance, one, one of the things is uh, uh, the fact that the, the, the lack of alignment, for instance, between the NFF and the mandates of the parliament and the commission, I mean, who, whose citizenship have to, has, has to decide, no? I mean, sometimes we have budget that have been approved by the latest uh, parliament. So that, that's a problem also of, of, of legitimacy in some sense, no? Another aspect, for instance, that is quite recent, that is important, is the importance of the European Council. That, that, that's something that the Parliament is very much uh, upset now. In the latest years, I mean, if we compare the European Council versus the Council of Ministers, I would say that um, we could accept that the Council of Ministers, because they vote through qualified majority, uh, and they are a bit less secretive, uh, less, you know, a bit less, uh, they, they work less in secret and uh, it, it's more known what they decide. It's a bit more, uh, you know, the, the citizens may have this, this maybe this, this, this perception that is more responsive to them than the European Council sometimes, you know, that is more. And in the latest uh, years, what has happened in the latest MFF negotiations is that the European Council has taken much more, uh, much more importance and for instance, one of the things that the European Parliament has been very critical is that in the European Council conclusions on MFF, they put a lot of things. The European Council does not have in principle legislative competence. And in the end, they not only decide the ceilings, you know, the overall volume of the budget and how it is distributed across headings, but they decide a lot of details 
on the policies that are going to be financed. A lot of details on how, uh, in concrete terms, the CAP, for instance, payments will be designed. Uh, a lot of details on uh, which will be uh, the, the, the design uh, characteristics of the EU cohesion policy. And that, in some sense, we could say that that also is a, something that is negative and goes, runs against, uh, you know, it, it creates a bit of, you know, this perception of democratic deficit or, you know, uh, this connection, no? Because in the end, I mean, the parliament is co-decider of these things, that, that the design of the policies with the council. And if the European Council decides this, the parliament, the complaint of the parliament is that everything is decided and then they go with the, to the council, to the, the discussion, and the council of ministers uh, say to them, well, uh, these, the, the leaders have these ideas and we cannot touch this, no? So it's a, it's a, a, lot, of, you know, a lot of democracy in some sense. Um, and then a third, a third thing that maybe also creates a bit, uh, a bit of, uh, a bit of democratic deficit is the fact that a lot, I mean, the lack of flexibility also, I think, because sometimes, I mean, it's also being responsive is also having the capacity to change the budget if there is a crisis or if there are changes or, and what we have now is not only we have this long-term budget, but it is a very rigid budget. And most of the money is reallocated to member states, and then we cannot touch it. No, that's also something related to the design of the budget. So, to summarize, I do not think the question of democratic deficit. We agree that there is a democratic deficit with the budget. Can be can be just um, you know folk, it can be only explained by the question of the balance of power within the parliament and the council. I think there are other design things in the EU budgetary process that explains the, this inability of the EU budget to be responsive to citizens' preferences. Then on the legitimacy, um, yeah, maybe one thing that I think it's important also to say maybe at the beginning, if you, if, when you treat this question is that historically, I, at least it's the perception I have, the EU budget has been mainly uh, relied to output legitimacy and has been used like this for the commission. I mean, the commission, always explain about what, what they have done with the EU budget and, and has been a very powerful tool of legitimacy. Yeah? It's, it's maybe not the only source of the legitimacy, but in some member states, for instance, in Spain, where I, where I believe, and in Greece, it's many people had, uh, they, there is not a lot of skepticism and many people has had a very good uh, in, in vision of Europe, partly because they know the EU funds and they know, you know, the, you know, the, the performance and the results of the EU budget. So, so that, that's something that uh, it, it's important maybe to highlight when we talk about EU budget and legitimacy. Then when we talk about, um, about uh, throughput uh, legitimacy, and I, I, I know that, <laughs> I mean, I am not the expert here, but I was a bit surprised when you talk, when, when you define the budget as something technocratic and a realm of experts, because I, I don't have at all this perception. I, I'm not saying that there is no problem of uh, throughput legitimacy, but um, I think the, the I mean, the, the decision of the EU budget, th there's a lot of uh, interested parties that participate. And it's very much politicized in the sense that, uh, I mean, we have recently seen with the CAP, now they have just approved the, the new CAP, the reform of the CAP. And there has been, as usual, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, pressure from the farmers associations and pressure also for the green, green associations now, the, you know, Greta Thunberg talked about the CAP and there has been a lot, I mean, my impression is that when they decide the new policies, uh, there are a lot of interested parties, particularly the beneficiaries, but not only because the green, green NGOs also are very active, uh, that intervene and, they, and, and, and they, they play a role and they influence the commission in the, in the proposal. The other question, and, and, and that's the question, whether it is legitimate, put legitimacy is okay or not, is whether this is made in a way that is inclusive and, and in, a, in, a way that, in a way that is fair and that all interested parties participate in a transparent and fair way. Uh, here we can have some doubts and maybe for instance, the latest just to put the polemic of the uh, two, two days ago was that uh, you know for the CAP reform, as I say, there was there were basically these two opposite uh, parties, no, the, the Greens, the Green Associations and the farmers. And the commission, it seemed that the commission invites once the farmers association inside the Charlemagne 
to discuss with them the proposal. And the green associations were very enraged with this because they say, well, that's not fair. Why you treat them as a privileged party and we don't have this, 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 this uh, access, no? So that's the question, whether, whether the, the access is equal for us and it's representative of citizens. But I would not define this as something technocratic and only for experts. I think, I mean, every time the commission does a, a conference on the new MFF, it's it, a lot of, of actors participating. Uh, and and the, quest, the difficult question here for me is, uh, which are the legitimate, I mean, how, how to decide whether it is inclusive, how to decide uh, which are the legitimate uh, partners, no? Uh, for instance, uh, you can you can distinguish between the private, the business, and the public. But in, in cohesion policy, for instance, some people complain that regions have a lot of power also to decide, and they are beneficiary, and sometimes they are not so innovative, and they are a bit against change. So it's difficult. But but in, in any case, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that this is a problem of, of experts. The problem I see in terms of uh, throughput legitimacy is more a problem of accountability. Uh, and that's 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 true that there is a bit of uh, problems of accountability. Apart from the, the 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 minor role of the parliament in the adoption of the budget, I would say uh, there are two things that uh, that are interesting to to explore maybe in your in your paper. One is the question of what what the parliament now calls the the budgetary galaxy. The fact that during the last years, what has happened is that since we couldn't put more put more, more things in the budget because uh, because of the unanimity and the veto right and, and so forth what it has happened is that we have created a lot of things outside the EU budget no a lot of e instruments and a lot of you know intergovernmental instruments and in these instruments the parliament does not have any right so that's clearly a, a problem of, of lack of uh, accountability for the parliament and the other thing that i think is very interesting is the, um, there, there was, uh, I think it was Michael Bauer and Stefan Baker, two, two German uh, scholars that, that, that did a very nice paper about um, the parliament capacity to exercise accountability. And what they say, the argument of the paper was that they receive a lot of information, the parliament, but they don't have analytical capacity. And, and therefore, in the end, they don't adjust very effectively this accountability because uh, they, they don't have a big, a big unit. And they compare, for instance, with, uh, with the US and they compare with the, there is, it seems that in the US Congress, there is a bureau, a budgetary bureau that does all an analysis of that. And, and that, I think it's interesting. It doesn't, I mean, it's very good to have information, but if you don't have the capacity to analyze it, it's not very useful. So, and then just to finalize uh, on autocratic legalism, uh, I am even less expert on that than, <laughs> than on democracy and, and, leg uh, and legitimacy, but maybe to, the thing that, uh, when, when you explain your examples on the first one on rule of law, my question is whether it is it is an EU exercise of autocratic legalism or it's a member states exercise or member states abuse of EU rules to exercise autocratic, autocratic legalism. Because if I have well understood your definition of autocratic legalism, it assumes the intention to abuse law in favor of illiberal, illiberal and liberal agenda. And I think it's a bit radical to say that the council has done this. The council may have not been able to prevent member states to do it, but uh, it's a bit too much saying that the council intentionally has done it. And in the case of the, the other example you give, the court, of, um, the court of Justice, the same. I mean, there was an intention of the Court of Justice to support an illiberal regime or uh, there were other reasons behind. I mean, I, I don't know this case of the region then, so I, I talked, but that, that's the two things that, that, that came to mind. And I stop here because I think I have already talked too much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Eulalia. I really appreciate it. Uh, Professor Schmidt, please, your remarks. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, a great talk and wonderful discussion comments. Uh, so, Eulalia, you don't leave me much to say. And thank goodness, because we don't have that much time, but I will probably take too much time anyway. So, um, Demetrius, I really like this. Um, I, what I find wonderful is you start out talking about budgets being boring. And I used to think that budgets were boring. I actually still think budgets are boring, but I recognize how important they are and how key they are to understanding the EU. And so I agree with you that actually it's not so much technical, but political. And Eulalia also said that. Um, 
Uh, it's 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 a, certainly about divergence preferences. You know, member states saying me me me. Uh, it's all about national interest, but of course, it's not simply national interest. It's not just self interest. Um, it's also about uh, not just how much, but for whom, to what end, and what is the EU in all of this? And I think there's a danger in assuming that simply because the member states are saying this is my red line, this is my red line, this is my red line, it doesn't mean that they're not thinking about how we move forward with the EU. And in fact, over, over time, yes, it remained 1%, but, but that still was more money. And one needs to ask, and, and I, I don't see you talking about this much, but so a question, and I'll come back to that at the end, but is the RFF, the Resilience and Recovery Fund, RRF, the Resilience and Recovery, is that a game changer? Because after all, this is an increase in the budget of a different kind. You're focused on the multi-annual financial framework and the annual budgets, but it seems to me that uh, with COVID-19, with this, it, with this temporary fund indeed, but the potential of a permanent fund um, and the fact that the, R, the RRF is, you know, breaks all the taboos against EU level debt. My question would be, don't you need to add a whole discussion of what this might mean to uh, not simply the politics? I mean, in a way, I think you've depicted the politics as negative, essentially, you know, we don't want to do this, it's about our self interest. Um, but if we look at what happened with the 21 to 27 budget, and add to that, the resilience recovery fund, you know, it seems to me that the whole dynamics, the politics have become positive rather than negative. So you could see, I think it's important to think about politicization, not simply as something negative, and problematic, but also something that can be positive. And you know, despite the frugal four, um, despite Hungary and Poland uh, stopping, you know, um, with its veto, uh, delaying things, and and certainly problematically uh, diluting or watering down the rule of law. And despite that, you know, the outcome was extraordinary, extraordinary for the EU. I mean, we've been talking for years about how insufficient the budget is, et cetera. And now all of a sudden, this new thing breaks all the budgetary taboos and makes it possible, I think, for the EU to move forward, to use it, you know, to create the equivalent of euro bonds, but of course, don't tell anyone, you know, these are safe assets. Oh, no, actually, we can't even call it that. No, it's just a temporary pandemic fund. But, but actually, this opens up potential. It's all about investment, investment in the future, in the uh, digital uh, transformation, sorry, the green, green transition, di digital transformation, and perhaps even addressing inequality issues. I mean, this is a major change. So it seems to me that, you know, at the end, you, you know, you might add, so on the, you, you might add, you know, you might talk about not only about authoritarian uh, legalism, if you will, um, but also maybe this other aspect that I think is a very positive one that has to do with, you know, it's not the traditional budget, but it's massive. So that's sort of one comment. And then on, um, I'll just agree with Eulalia on issues of the democratic deficit. It's, it is a contested concept. Uh, in my 2006 book on democracy in Europe, I basically see the democratic deficit is mainly at the national level as the increasing importance of the EU as more and more decision decisions are taking up to the taken up to the EU level that it empties the national level of input legitimacy view of sort of kind of the kind of democratic politics that we think about it becomes hollowed out and so that's one aspect and at the EU level yes you're right there's a kind of democratic deficit at the same time we're thinking national democracy when we say that. 
actually as an international organization, as a supranational entity that is increasingly a polity with state-like capacity, what's extraordinary is um, the way in which it is driven to become more and more <clears throat> democratic in a national sense. Obviously it's not that because it's not a democracy in the traditional sense, but its member states are democracies as Eulandia mentioned, and that's tremendously important. And the EU attempts to be democratic, which doesn't mean that there aren't tremendous problems. And you're absolutely right about that. Um, uh, so, so you know, I, I just move to move on to you know, sort of the kind of the legitimizing mechanisms um, of democracy. I think I think you do a nice uh, nice job about talking talking about input and output and throughput legitimacy, but. <clears throat> and Eulala has actually done a very nice job discussing that too. You know, so <clears throat> there's much less that I can say now because you've actually, you know, given that a lot of meat. But so I'd just like to come into um, sort of the issue of throughput legitimacy and to add what Eulalia said about it's not simply the realm of experts, not just technocratic, although obviously there's a tremendous amount of technocracy involved. Um, but that's because, you know, the council, the council is not an input legitimate forum. You know, the member states speak for their own constituencies, but as they sit together, they don't represent a democratic forum. That's a mistake. It's the only way I can see uh, legitimacy there uh, in in it is through th is in terms of throughput legitimacy, and in in my book on the eurozone crisis, I sort of ask, you know, is the count what in, during the eurozone crisis was the council a um, dictatorship led by Germany and its northern European coalition allies, or could we see it as a mutually accountable deliberative body? And I think when we're starting to talk about uh, the budgetary discussions, one might be able to argue that it is something of a mutually accountable deliberative body. They're all deliberating, to get, deliberating together and at least in terms of the budget, this is not true for the Eurozone crisis where uh, it was all in the shadow of Germany. I'm not so sure that you can say that any one member state is really in control here or has more weight than another. I mean, and in this, you could say on the common agricultural policy, which I think, you know, when we're talking about, and Eulalia already mentioned that, but when we're talking about what the problem of the budget is, it's really the cap. And if we're talking cap, we're talking France, you know, so the, the, that's a whole other issue that I'm not going to go into, but thinking about the budget on a more positive stance, one could say, well, actually, this is one area where there's a kind of mutual accountability. Um, at the same time, we could ask, what about the co-decision process? Here you could suggest that co-decision is actually perhaps even more legitimate in some sense in the through throughput terms, or could be, because the co-decision process brings in more actors. It's the council, the Commission and the European Parliament. And here, the European Parliament is really important, as you mentioned. And there, the question would be, does the European Parliament exercise, um, is, it, does it act as an accountability forum, which is another aspect to, you know, another side of the, if it's co-decision, we're in a mute, mutual accountability, sort of a, a, a mutually accountable deliberative body. If we're talking about um, the council making the decisions, to what extent can the European Parliament act as an accountability forum? And here we have problems, clearly. So I'll just raise that because I can see we're running out of time. Um, autocratic legalism. And here I have to agree again with Eulalia. I have a little problem with that because it really looks about looks as when you, you when you use the Hungary Poland example, you really are talking about a problem of national authoritarian uh, autocratic regimes, basically, 
autocratic legalism and it's a serious problem but it's 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 not autocratic legalism that the eu is imposing it's that the eu has these institutional constraints that it simply can't get out of because of the unanimity rule we can say the same thing about regional authorities um so uh, i'm going to end uh right now but sort of ask one question which is yeah, I think one place you can talk about authoritarian legalism at the EU level is in, is, is in the Eurozone crisis, as it applied in particular to Southern Europe and in particular to Greece. So I was curious, you know, as to why you wouldn't apply it there. You know, here we've got failed output performance. We've got a three throughput lack of legitimacy as Germany and Northern Europe dominate the meetings. You know, there's a gun, if, if you want to call it, uh, deliberation, it's, 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 you know, deliberation with a gun to people's heads with threats from the ECB that they're going to pull the plug. This is, to my mind, serious authoritarian legalism because they're saying, oh, you have to follow the rules. And we've doubled down on the rules and we've re we've created new rules, but you have to follow them. So just to end, how do we solve these problems? You mentioned some kind of new way of democratizing it. And, you know, I would suggest, I've, I've written about this a bit, but, you know, why not create a new democratic budgetary dialogue? I've talked about a new macroeconomic dialogue to get beyond um, governing by rules and ruling by numbers, forget the numbers and rules and create uh, and, and talk about perhaps guidelines, but have all the EU actors more open also to civil society and the social partners actually talk about the macroeconomics. But I would think the same thing could be done with the budget. You know, and I wonder how you see the conference on the future of Europe. Is that a place where one could begin to talk about reform? So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Vivian. I, um, I will take uh, the prerogative of the moderator here to inject one more, um, one more comment on, uh, on uh, Dimitris' uh, presentation, which was uh, very instructive. So um, one important shift in your presentation was uh, to the realm that you called legal. Uh, which of course is of particular interest to me. But to me, the shift was not so much from the political to the legal, but rather to the analysis of uh, crisis of legitimacy, uh, a shift from the spend, from the building part, making the budget to the spending part. Okay, so that was the shift. That's when you started looking at what happens at what kind of input, out, output, and perhaps through, uh, throughput we have in the context of spending the budget. And you mentioned the case of the regions and the, uh, in the desire to uh, expand the participants in the process of spending decisions by bringing the regions into the fray. Um, I think that uh, the adding to your book, to your project, a, a part on um, legitimacy in the spending of the budget would be a very nice complement to the legitimacy analysis in the making of the budget. And you should keep that distinct. But in doing that, uh, I'm interested in not so much uh, what happens before the European Court of Justice, the litigation started by the regions that you mentioned, and it's been an interest of mine since 2010, um, but also uh, what you are really an expert in, which is the Court of Auditors. In other words, uh, uh, using the proceedings before the Court of Auditors as something that might actually enhance the control of the way in, uh, on the way in which decisions are made at the spending level, instead of only at the building the budget level. Okay, I think I'm, uh, I'm in a position to give a brief reply and first of all to thank all of you for very invaluable and quite insightful comments. Uh, as I said, this is an ongoing research, so I'm the first to admit that there are elements that need to be further elaborated, so I'm glad that you did some of the work for me, <laughs> I have to admit that. Uh, and uh, now, coming on uh, some specific points that uh, all three of you highlighted, now, of course, EU budget is a sweet generous budget, I fully agree with you. Uh, and. Uh, one of my proposals at the end of my presentation is to modify the entire scheme in a such a manner that would uh, add a fiscal dimension to this budget. So that would uh, be able in a position to have a more 
uh, normal, if I may use this term, budget in the EU. Uh, now, uh, with regard to the uh, participation of the uh, European Parliament in the negotiating process, especially the MFF and the fact that the Lisbon Treaty changed and incorporated the MFF negotiations into EU primary law uh, well be before we had the interinstitutional agreements. Well, I have highlighted that actually this has mitigated European Parliament's uh, authority. While the Parliament seemed to be more oh, in, in a more enhanced position when we're talking about the annual budgetary process, practically this enhanced position has been mitigated, has been, let's say, secretly reduced by the fact that in the MFF and the own resources are decided at the intergovernmental level, if I may use this term. Uh, and my idea was that in that respect, the European Parliament should flex its muscles a bit. It should seek for more authority. Uh, and of course, I fully understand, and that would be another point regarding the differences that the MEPs have amongst themselves about what the EU budget should be in terms of context. Uh, context. Now, the idea of using throughput legitimacy to examine the budget is my idea of actually seeing the procedures. And I'm using uh, Vivian's model in that respect in order to evaluate the procedures of the budgetary governance in order to see whether we have actually, or how we can achieve legitimacy at procedural level, not just input or output, but also in the procedural level of the budgetary aspect. And uh, in that respect, uh, I, feel, I, I really feel that uh, we have a lot of actors involved in formulate policies, that's correct. Nobody questions the involvement. You said correctly that the new cap has been decided by following a very extensive dialogue, fair enough. However, the money that has been attributed, has been allocated to CAP within the overall resources of the EU and uh, the quality of the involvement and in terms of affecting the result. And this is what I'm using from Vivian's arguments in uh, with that, uh, throughput legitimacy, how much it can affect the result of the product that will take us to output legitimacy. This is the issue that I would like to highlight. Now, one issue that you mentioned comparing the European Parliament with the US Congress, and this is, I will link it with uh, Daniela's comment about the ECA, the European Court of Auditors. Indeed here, we have the Government Accountability Office, which filters and uh, provides Congress with analytical information regarding uh, the budget and how this budget is being prepared and used. The ECA could do the same and actually, uh, I have an appointment with uh, the head of GAO, Government Accountability Office in the States uh, within this month in order to discuss their role, in order to use it as an example for a suggestion regarding the ECA. So I have taken on board that uh, uh, suggestion that both of you have, hi have highlighted uh, in uh, my presentation. Now, with regard to Vivian's uh, questions regarding R RFF, I did not uh, enter the RFF uh, decision, not because I want to leave it outside. Of course, it is a very important development, the fact that the EU has decided to change its approach regarding, uh, first, the size of the budget, although at a temporary level, but it changes the size, and it also violates one of the budgetary principles. Because don't forget that according to one of the principles, I don't remember now which one, but I think it is uh, universal. Eulalia may, might help me with that. The EU was not allowed to seek money from the markets. Legally speaking, was not allowed to do that. Now, exceptionally, they and they have done it today, actually. Today, they did the first contact with international banks and they secured the first 10 billion that will enter uh, as amount uh, with regard to the resources being available from the RFF. So it is a significant uh, element. Hopefully it will go further. I will elaborate on that using analysis that you, Vivian, has, have made. Eulalia has made an analysis as well. So I will use that, uh, of course, in analysis. But I'm afraid that having seen the reactions during the negotiation of uh, last July, July 2020, I believe that uh, in that case, the frugal four or other member states would be much more reluctant in making this a systematic tool. Why? Because there is always the concept of the net contributor state. 
You said that, uh, for instance, in the Eurozone crisis, yes, it was Germany that was dominating the debate. I'm afraid that this happened here, not only with Germany. Germany was just presiding over the debate as, chair, as uh, the chair of the council. However, everybody was feeling Germany's hot breath because Germany is the net contributor. And the other states, the Netherlands, for instance, are, are also net contributors. So they put forward this capacity of net contributors in order to influence the discussions within the council. So I'm afraid that this might be a bit more difficult if we do not manage to overcome this concept of having net contributors and net recipients, because there will be always this division and always net recipients will be seen as not the bad boys, but those that uh, try to take advantage of the rest, unfortunately. So thank you very much for your comments. I have taken them on board and uh, I will try to infiltrate my research with them. And as you see, some of them have been already streamlined uh, in further advancement of the research. Thank you so much, Dimitris. So we are out of time for this live event, but uh, uh, we can definitely continue offline. I will be delighted to follow up with comments uh, with the, also the, the, part the participants. Feel free to send questions um, to the uh, main speaker, uh, Professor Skiadas, and to our esteemed discussants, uh, Dr. Rubio and Professor Schmidt. Um, it's been a pleasure to host you here, and uh, I look forward to more. Uh, definitely uh, the budget is not boring, uh, in my view. <laughs>